A mud volcano has been erupting for 10 years and scientists still are not, are not aware, they're undecided of what is causing it. This is what a mud volcano explosion looks like. And this is of course a close-up of one of the craters bubbling usually these types of volcanoes and we do have the United States and Salton Sea and even in Yellowstone and of course in Long Valley Caldera and this is what a town covered by, with the mud flows looks like. As you can see the man is walking towards the building, the roof of what used to be a building. This is a totally different type of landscape as you can see filled in with uh, tens of feet of uh, mud from the flow and it's wiped everything out. Usually they have carbon deposits, that is they have gas deposits under that to be found under these volcanoes. This is another example of what a mud flow from a mud volcano looks like, another town that is flooded by mud. So what's causing these is still um, undecided by geologists. This is on the conversation by Richard Davis, Pro Vice Ch uh, Chancellor of Engagement and Internationalization, Newcastle University, and Michael Magna, Professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences, University of California at Berkeley. The world's most destructive mud volcano was born near the town of Sidoarjo in the island of Java, Indonesia, just over 11 years ago, and to this day it has not stopped erupting. The mud volcano known as Lucy started May 29, 2006, and at its peak disgorged a staggering 180,000 cubic meters of mud every single day. It was burying villages in mud up to 40 meters thick, that's over 120 feet. The worst event of its kind in recorded history, that's like a 10-story building. So you can understand how bad it is. The worst event of its kind in recorded history, the eruption took 13 lives, destroying homes of 60,000 people. But although the mud is still flowing more than 10 years later, scientists are not yet agreed on what's causing this. The debate is whether the eruption of Lucy, L-U-S-I, was due to an earthquake several days before that or down to a catastrophic failure of the Banjar Pinji 1 gas exploration well that was being drilled nearby at that time. As we said, mud volcanoes have deposits of natural gas underneath. Now, given the huge impact of the volcano on the communities nearby in the fields that were their livelihoods, why are we still unsure of what's causing this? Mud volcanoes are extremely common on Earth, with thousands of examples known worldwide. They come in many shapes, sizes, and behave a little like their molten rock counterparts in other words, volcanoes that spout lava. So going through long periods of inactivity with periodic violent eruptions, mud volcanoes, though, spew out not molten hot lava from the Earth's mantle, but instead a cold mixture of gas, water, and solids. Some of those spectacular examples of mud volcanoes are in Azerbaijan. A lot of these pictures that we have, them, and this one here is Azerbaijan, for example. You can see the explosion, what it looks like. So um, Azerbaijan, they can range from a few meters across to the size of a small mountain. They're commonly found at tectonic plate boundaries and also underwater at river deltas where sediment is buried rapidly, causing unusually high pressures to build up underground. The muddy mix is also pushed to the surface by the buoyant gas that it contains. Usually mud volcanoes grow slowly through layer upon layer of mud but what happens in so Doarjo in 2006 is unique, with Lucy, by far the fastest growing mud volcano we know of, having drowned surrounding houses, factories, places of worship and schools in a foul-smelling emulsion like mud. Now, drilling or earthquake? The journal Marine Petro Petro Petroleum Geology is publishing a special issue that examines the ways this amazing phenomenon is developing. It includes one paper by geologist Stephen Miller and Adriano Mazzini, more than 10 years of Lucy, a review of facts, coincidences, and past and future studies, and that exhumes the debate of what causes the eruption, what caused the eruption, offering strong support for the earthquake as a trigger, and dismissing the idea of the borehole, that the borehole was responsible, the drilling, that is. The explanation implicating the drilling is that water from the surrounding bedrock 
entered the 2,834-meter-deep Banjar Pinji Wan Well, which for its lowest 1,743 meters was unprotected by steel and cement casing. So the drilling was not protected by steel and cement, as you can understand. The pressure the water exerted was enough to fracture the surrounding rock or pre-existing faults, mixing the underground mud from Caliban formation, which makes up part of Java's geology, this pressurized water and mud rushed to the surface through a fault, forming the Lucy mud volcano just 200 meters from that drilling site. So it was, the Lucy mud volcano was just about 600 feet from the feet from the drill, the borehole. So basically, they were, you know, I would say, geological wise, they were drilling right next to the volcano. Now the alternative explanation is that despite its proximity, the drilling well was coincidental and that the 3.6 magnitude Yogyakarta earthquake on May 27, 260 kilometers away, had sent vibrations to the Kilin Bend formation's mud layer, causing it to liquefy and rise to the surface under pressure. That earthquake, the 6.3 magnitude, can trigger eruptions, uh, has been documented as far back as Pliny's Encyclopedia in the first century AD, it's also the case that the eruption started as a series of small eruptions, all aligned along a geological fault, so the role of the earthquakes certainly deserves full consideration. But in comparison with other eruptions triggering, triggered by the earthquakes, such as in Azerbaijan, Pakistan, and California, the Indonesia Yogyakarta earthquake was very far away given its size, more compelling still is that there have been bigger and closer earthquakes that have not triggered eruptions, while other earthquakes have caused greater sink shaking and vibrations right at the site of Lucy. Yet nothing happened on those occasions. Now, if the earthquake caused liquefaction, we would expect to see the widespread release of gas from the liquefied layer, but a study by Mark Tangay and colleagues in 2015 showed this did not happen. The well was drilled by the Indonesian company PT Lapindo Brantas, which blamed the earthquake. Of course, what do you expect a company to do? And they'd be, otherwise, they'd be uh, liable to pay for the damages. So they blamed the earthquake. Anyway, information on the borehole was passed to us at the time, which showed there was an influx of water that we estimated was sufficient to cause the rocks around the uncased borehole to crack. And you must remember, they didn't case the borehole with cement and iron, they just left it at, uh, with its natural surroundings. So the new paper by Miller and Mazzini does not bring any new information or reasoning to the debate, which will now probably remain mired unless a new data from the borehole or, or from the critical period at the end of May 2006 comes to light, and this is unlikely. Distinguishing between two hypotheses for a unique event can be a challenge. We cannot go back in time and collect the ideal set of data and samples to test the hypotheses, nor can we make direct comparisons with other similar phenomena for which we know the case. There are other major disasters that will still, uh, we still cannot be certain had a man-made cause, such as earthquakes potentially triggered by filling dams with water. In the case of Lucy, we very strongly favor the argument that the drilling was responsible but neither of us were at the site of the incident almost two kilometers underground at the time to witness it, and more than 10 years on, it's clear the data and reasoning behind our argument have yet to convince everyone. This is on the conversation. Please leave your comments. Thank you for your support. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue 
my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece, in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.